Well, uh, now we've come to the point in our, our uh, service to open the Bible, so I'm going to ask you to, to do that, open to 1 Peter and chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 8 to 12. So I will turn there in my Bible, and uh, I'm going to read it together. I don't mean responsibly, just that I'll read it. Uh, you'll listen, but um, we're reading it together before the Lord. This is, this is God's word. This is God speaking to us. This is his message to us for today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing for, and there's a quote from Psalm 34, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. May we pray. So, Lord, as we open up your word, we recognize that you being the author of it, are among us to then teach us. We pray for the power of your spirit, both to preach and to listen. And we pray for the power of your spirit for both the preacher and the listeners together as under all, under you, the authority of your word to respond, to, to say, yes, Lord, this is what we intend to do. For we, we stand under your authority, all of us. And so we pray that you would minister to our hearts this morning. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can see in the insert that you have in your bulletin, uh, the title of the sermon is An Ancient Recipe for a Happy Life. And I take that uh, based on the fact that he quotes from a psalm. So thousands of years uh, ago were written these words that Peter quotes 2,000 years ago, and he says, this ancient remedy, this ancient recipe for a happy life is still true today. And so as I re uh, read this and studied it, I see three ingredients for a zestful life, a happy life, even in the face of growing hostility. Three ingredients for a zestful life in spite of growing hostility hostility. <clears throat> if you're like me, I kind of assume that the persecuted church is a sad church, and I have made, that's a wrong assumption. I do not believe that's a correct assumption. Oh, it's true that they experience terrible times of sadness and grief, depending on the level of persecution, because in some cases, uh, church members are dragged away and, and executed. And so the church is saddened and grieved over the loss of their brothers and sisters in Christ. But that does not mean that their hearts are continually sad. The Bible says that we can have a happy life even in spite of growing hostility. And that with God in control, even official opposition, even official opposition cannot make good days bad. Because God, because God is the giver of happiness, true happiness. And in this text, then, I find three ingredients for a zestful life. In verse 8, I see him, Peter, addressing the church itself. So he's addressing believer-to-believer -believer relationships. And the church is relating to one another, and the key word there is unity, unity of mind, humble mind, and so on. That's verse 8. So we're to pursue unity and family love. I'm labeling that a compelling community. When we look at those descriptions, 
I see a healthy church there in verse 8. And I'm, I'm labeling that a compelling community. In verses 9 to 11, we don't see necessarily a, uh, an emphasis on believer-to-believer -believer relationships. We see how the believer relates to a hostile world. So it's a believer relating to the world that opposes Christianity. It's believer-to-unbeliever relationships. The church relating to a hostile world. And the key word is blessing. That God wants to bless us. He wants to use us to be a blessing. He wants us to obtain a blessing. And so we are a blessing community. A community that blesses. That's verses 9 to 11. We are determined to bless those who oppose us. So we have a compelling community a blessing community, a community that spreads blessing. And then verse 12, we are a trusting community. The key word is trust. We have a relationship with God. You see, we have relationships with each other in a compelling community. We have relationships to those in a hostile world, and so we are to be a blessing community. And then under it all is a, a relationship with our God and so together, we relate to our Father, and we are a trusting community. We have prayerful trust in the power of God. And so that's the message today. That's where we're headed with these thoughts. And so I, I, and we're not going to spend equal time in all of them, but I, I wanted you to see how it all works together, at least in my mind, and, and then we'll, we'll kind of break it down here. So in our text, in verse 8, I see a description of a church that has compelling community. This is church life as it should be. These are the marks of a healthy church. And I want you to see, it may not be completely evident uh, in the English text, and what little of what little Greek I know, which is very little. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that some word, the translators have supplied some English words just for the sake of flow. But when you read it, <clears throat> literally, it would read, finally, all unity of mind. And so those terms, unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind, I want you to look at those, they're actually all adjectives. <clears throat> and there actually isn't a verb in the sentence, in the, in the original. Peter is like, he's looking at, what he's spoken to, he's spoken to citizens and said, submit to authority, servants, submit to your masters, wives, submit to your husbands, husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way. He's addressed these different areas, and now he's kind of come full circle, and now he's saying, finally, all, and the of you and the verb have, are supplied just for the sake of flow. But he's continuing his thoughts about how we should live in this world, and he just he just blurts out adjectives. There's no verb here. And all he's saying is, finally, all, have unity, or excuse me, finally, all, unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. This is what I want you to have in this hostile world. I want you to be a compelling community, a community that compels uh, interest, a community that compels others to look at it and say, that's what I want in life. So what are these characteristics of a compelling community in verse 8? So unity of mind is the beginning. He says, have unity of mind or just unity of mind. And the idea there is not uniformity where we, we don't think for ourselves. We're not all clones, but rather we share the same spiritual values. We, we uh, share the same theological values. Uh, truths where we defend the same truths together. We contend together for the gospel. And most of all, we're devoted to the same glorious Jesus, the same glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. We have these commonalities. The truths of Scripture unite us. And this is very interesting. If you were to travel to other parts of the world other and and be with people of a different culture and different languages, as my brother, as you heard, has, has done, 
you'll notice that when you're there, that if they have a Bible, and they are a true biblical community of, of a church, in other words, they're the same. They don't, they're, the worship style might be different. All those, those external things might be different. But when it comes down to what's most important, it's, you, you share. It's like your home because these things unite us. We have a unity of mind. These biblical truths have a common effect on people all over the world, especially when we unite around this common love for and devotion to, to Jesus and to the scriptures that teach about him. Uh, what are the biblical truths that we share together that, that unite us specifically? Well, scripture, the fact that scripture is our authority, that we are under scripture. In other words, that we, we live our lives under the authority of the Word of God, that the Word of God is our authority for what we believe and how we should live, that we answer to, to God through the Scriptures. In other words, we believe that what God wants us to know and how we ought to live is right there in our Bible. And so that when we are called as believers in a hostile world to compromise these truths, when we are forced, when, when even after uh, appealing to authority, it doesn't work. When, the, when authority over us, human, human authority over us, calls us to compromise those truths, we find ourselves needing to yield to the authority of Scripture rather than to sinful authority uh, of men. It's Scripture. The Bible unites us. The common truths like the Trinity... That shapes how we worship. You know, we believe that there's one God, one being called God, and that he exists in three persons eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that each of these persons are God, and they have attributes of God, and they're co-equal together, and they have eternally existed in this relationship, and it's called Trinity. We've labeled it Trinity. These this truth unites us. The fact that we, we come from God's creative hand, that our origins are from God. We didn't make ourselves. We're not, we didn't arise from some primordial slime. We, nothing from nothing, you know, it, it isn't like out of nothing came something so complex that we can't even describe. We can't even describe all of plant life. All that, some of the things about plant life remain a mystery. And yet, we have a culture that teaches all this arose by itself. No, we, we are uh, united by a common understanding that our origin is from God. We know who made us. We know why we're here. We know where we're going. We know who made us. And we know that God made us. We didn't make ourselves. We don't choose our gender. God made us. The origins that we, we unite around that truth. The, the truth about the fall unites us. That, that we believe that our original parents, Adam and Eve, yielded to the temptation of Satan. And they willfully disobeyed God. And as a result, brought sin into the world. And as a result, death. And so, all die. And, and that is not a, 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 a wonderful truth other than the fact that it's truth and, and it explains the way things are. And a common understanding of that unites us. We understand why things are the way they are. The fall explains that. The in, we, we unite around truths like the incarnation of Christ, the Son of God. He became man. He's the God-man, manhood added to deity. We unite around the truths of the atonement, that Jesus suffered in our place as our substitute. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. It is not by our works. That truth unites us. The return of Christ. We are united around the truth that this isn't all there is. And that even though evil seems to be winning, that there's coming a day when Christ will return and he will make all things new and the wrongs will be righted and justice will be served, and righteousness will prevail. And we unite around that truth, 
And that gives us hope. And the gospel unites us. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. And all who repent of their sin and trust in Jesus alone to save them from the wrath of God are saved. They're given forgiveness of sin. They're given new life. They're given the hope of heaven. They're given purpose in life. They live life in the presence of God, with God, with them. And so we unite around the gospel. These truths unite us. They give us so much in common. They give us unity of mind. They regulate our worship. They fill us with a common hope. They move us toward a common goal. We are all different in so many ways. And we have very strong opinions about everything. Nonetheless, let us unite around these common truths. We have one, let us have oneness, unity of mind. And then Peter says another part of this compelling community is that we have sympathy. We have the same emotions. It's what Paul referred to in Romans 12 when he said, we ought to rejoice with those who rejoice and we ought to weep with those who weep. And let me tell you, sympathy grows as you pray for others and it grows even more when you pray with others, when you get together and pray with them. And that's part of the downside of the pandemic. Yes, God is working his plan, I understand that, but we, we have to come to the conclusion that in this compelling community, we need each other. We need to be together. And I long for the day when the, the only thing we're going to spread is love and affection for each other. And, we, and, and sympathy is one of those things when we pray together, we feel what the other person feels. Feels. And yes, we can do that online. I understand all that. But there is nothing like being together face to face. And then Peter says, brotherly love. Hey, he says, we're family. We stick together. We're loyal to one another. We don't always agree on everything. We got varying opinions on politics and uh, the size and role of government, whether or not the government should mandate shutdowns and whether it should mandate wearing masks and the whole thing. Yes, we have different opinions about all that. But these differences should not hinder sibling love and loyalty. Just because you differ from another should not stop you from loving as a brother or sister in Christ. Why is that? We have a common heavenly father. We have an older brother named the Lord Jesus Christ. And the rest of us are siblings in this heavenly family. And so don't let the differences hide our unity. Let us have brotherly love. And then uh, he says, not only should we have brotherly love, but we ought to have a tender heart. And this speaks to the deepest human emotional level. The word that's translated tender heart. I can't even pronounce it in the Greek. But it means, it means this area of us, this, that, um, the boiler room of our physical being, heart, lungs, liver, everything that just uh, vital organs, we, it's the gut. In other words, when we have this, this tender heart, when, when we look at another brother or sister in Christ and they're going through a hard time, we feel it. It, we feel it in the gut, that, that very inner core of our being. It rings out with it. We feel things at the deepest part of ourself. It's compassion. It's what moved Jesus. You read it in the Gospels. Jesus, moved with compassion, did this or said that. It's, it's that internal uh, uh, emotion that moves us to action. And then he says... The last characteristic of this compelling community, he says, have a humble mind. In other words, don't think more of yourself than you ought to think. Think with sober judgment, as Paul said. He said, as Paul said in Romans 12, don't be haughty. Don't be high-minded, but be willing to associate with the lowly. Don't be wise in your own eyes. And Philippians chapter 2 is another reference to humility where Paul writes, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility 
count others more significant than yourselves, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to, to write about that wonderful hymn of praise to Jesus, where it talks about Jesus, though being God, didn't regard that the, what he is owed as something he had to cling to, even though he deserved worship and adoration in heaven. He left, he left that to come here to be humbled, to become one of us, and to be a servant, and to die the death that we deserve. He didn't think of his own interests only. He thought of us. And Paul is saying, that's the humility that we need. Peter is saying, that's the humility that we should have. So we ought to be a church known for humility and tenderness and compassion, oneness of mind, oneness of heart, oneness of purpose, oneness of beliefs, because these create a zest for life. When we are unified together, even in the midst of a hostile culture, we can live a truly happy life from a biblical sense because we have this, we are part of a compelling community. And so this compelling community zest for life helps us to relate to a hostile world. The world is looking for a compelling community, a community that, no, they don't always agree on every little thing, but a community that's unified. And so that's the kind of community that we need to be. So what's the first ingredient to uh, a, a life that's truly happy, uh, where we can have a zest for life, is to be a part of a compelling community. And then the second uh, uh, ingredient of this happy life, this ancient recipe, is that we ought to be a blessing community, that we're determined to bless those who oppose us. And this is verses 9 to 11. <clears throat> By the way, when we use the word blessing, <clears throat> uh, don't assume it's the Joel Osteen uh, mile, wild, mile wide smile of, you know, influence and increase and all that mess. There's nothing wrong with influence and increase. Don't misunderstand. I'm all for both and anything else that God wants to give. But we, uh, we have sort of locked in the idea of blessing into one thing and one thing only, where I add to my bank account, I add to my, you know, my followers on Twitter, I, I increase in influence and, you know, whatever else. And in this context of this verse, blessing means the results of suffering. Unfortunately, you don't hear that too often in our world of evangelical preachers. Some do, I understand that, but the Bible speaks of blessing in a spectrum of ways, not just one way. It's truly wonderful to be blessed financially, to have more influence and all. It's truly wonderful, but <clears throat> don't assign that only, that that's what blessing only means. In this text here, the blessing are the results of what happens in suffering. So how do we bless those who oppose us? How do we bless them? It's a question I was asking myself this week because it wasn't all that clear until I just looked a little further. And so I believe what Peter is saying is that we bless those who oppose Christianity in several different ways. I'm going to give that to you. First of all, we bless those who oppose us when we refuse revenge by making room for God's wrath, verse 9. Say, so look at verse 9. Don't repay evil for evil or re reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. You want to be blessed? This is how you do it. You bless those who, who uh, oppose you. How do you do that? First of all, refuse to retaliate, but make room for God's wrath. So in other words, refuse to respond to evil actions with further evil actions. Refuse to respond to abusive speech with more abusive speech. Refuse retaliation. By the way, you know, it's one thing where we say, well, you know, I didn't hit him back in the nose 
but I let them have it with my, my words. Folks, that's still retaliation. That's still paying back. And I don't think it, it, it's limited just to the world opposing Christians. Sometimes, you know, even believers can get, and they, even in marriage. So let's just be honest and say that, you know, it's very easy. It's just natural. It's a knee-jerk reaction to just give, you know, for, for us to give back what somebody gives us. So we bless opposition when we refuse to do that. And so we need to understand, you know, uh, the power of the tongue and, uh, and learn to restrain our words, even if, you know, we'd like to really let them have it with our speech. We need to, to see how powerful words can be. In fact, I read uh, this week on a gray slate tombstone on a windswept hill in an English churchyard are etched these words on, on the tombstone. Beneath this stone, a lump of clay lies, her name, Arabella Young, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. You see, a little bit hard to hold back, isn't it? But we need to understand that we cannot retaliate even with our words. Our words can penetrate, Reckless words pierce like a sword. Our words can spread like a fire. Proverbs says a scoundrel plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. And just a few words can make a great impact. You know, James, we studied the tongue in James, you know. And here's this little part of our body. It's only, you know, a couple inches long. And as, uh, as I read somewhere... The tongue is only three inches long, but it can slay a six-foot man. You know, uh, the power of words. Uh, a tongue is such a small thing related to the size of our body. And James says, just think about what small things make a big difference, like the rudder of a ship, such a small little piece, yet it, it moves the entire craft. Think about the, the bit and bridle in the back of a horse's mouth. There's this huge animal but just this little piece of metal inside the mouth moves that horse to the left or to the right. A spark will light a forest fire, and just a little poison can kill you. You see, illustrations of the tongue. We need to refuse revenge, whether it's physical or verbal, because we can leave room for the wrath of God. That's verse 12 where uh, Peter encourages them by saying, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. And then there's this word, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. <clears throat> you ever watch a football game where it is so intense and opposing linemen after the play is over, maybe one threw the other to the, you know, to the ground a little more than they should have. And they're like, they get up on their feet, and you can see them, you know, button their helmets together. They're, one's in the face of the other. It's not usually a good thing when somebody is in your face. I don't think any of us can imagine when God gets in your face. Because we need to leave room, then, for the wrath of God. God is going to deal with evil. And because God will deal with evil, we don't have to help somebody get theirs. God will see to it. So it's not our job. In fact, the Bible says that uh, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's a, uh, it's in Romans 12, but it's a quote from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. So vengeance... Retaliation is something reserved for God. That's his seat. Have you ever gone to a, a sporting event where you had to, you know, pay for your seat? You get a seat number, row, such and such, seat, such and such. And uh, maybe you got a cheap seat. And then you waited till midway through the, uh, the event. And you look down 
and you can see a whole bunch of empty seats, good seats. And you kind of go, you know, at the break, you go down, you get a better seat until the usher comes and says, can I see your ticket, please? And, uh, 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 well, uh, yeah, oh, I see, uh, you're supposed to be back, you're up there. This is not your seat. Get out, <laughs> this, this is not yours. Well, when we take revenge, we are sitting in God's reserved seat. And we need to sit in our own seat. You may ask, as, as I was this week, how does not retaliating bless someone who's opposing us? Here's my answer to that, and it's, it's probably a multiple layered answer, but here's my answer. We bless those who oppose us when we refuse to retaliate because we are pointing them to the person that they are really opposing. You see, if we get back, then, then we make the conflict between two humans. But when, when people oppose Christianity, you know as well as I, as Paul said, our conflict is not with flesh and blood, but it is with principalities and powers and rulers of the, this dark world. And so when we make it between two people and we exact revenge, we've, then we've made it between two people instead of us saying, oh, well, let me just tell you, you're not really opposing me. You're opposing God, and since you can't see him, you're, you're going to get to me. But the real issue is between you and God. And what that does is it provides the Lord the opportunity to work in a person's heart where they say, they realize that their conflict is truly with God and they're accountable to God. And so in that sense, by not retaliating, we are blessing those who oppose. We, we are a blessing community. And <clears throat> that's, that's not all there is to blessing. We, that's just part of it. We bless by not retaliating. We bless by doing good. It's not just what we don't do. That's kind of what we put off. You'll see it all through Scripture. Put off this, don't do that. Put on this, do this. It's never a vacuum. It's never just don't, don't, don't. It's don't do this so that you can do this. So don't take revenge so that you can do something else. You can do good. Look at verse 11. Let him turn away from evil and do good. And you'll see that phrase, do good, all throughout Peter. Multiple times you'll see him saying to his people, do good. If you're going to be uh, slandered, let, let it be for doing good. So we do good. When we do good, we bless those who oppose us. That's an Old Testament principle, Exodus 23. Um, so the Old Testament law says, if your enemies run away ox or donkey, you, if you come across, if you run across paths with your, your enemy's runaway animal, don't give it a kick and move it on. Put a rope around it and bring it back to your enemy. That's right out of the Old Testament, Exodus 23. Or uh, probably one that you're more familiar with is Proverbs 25, where uh, Solomon writes, Feed your enemy, give him something to drink. It will be like burning coals on his head. They're going to have that sense of shame and perhaps repent because they know God will judge them for for mistreating those who are doing good. We overcome evil with good. That's, that's part of blessing those who oppose us. So we refrain from retaliation. We do good. We, we pray for those who oppose us. That's doing good. And we seek peace and pursue it. That's the last part of verse 11. Uh, do good and seek peace and pursue it. We're, we're not warlike people. We're, we're not always trying to pick a fight. But this peace is also not peace at any price. Keep that in mind. I have a hunch that as this new administration moves on and continues to run out of ink signing executive orders, that the call for peace, I'm all in. The call for let's heal this, I'm all in. I'm all in for that. 
but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about what kind of peace is going to be asked for. I'm kind of concerned about whether it's going to be, look, you're just going to have to give up those religious beliefs that just don't fit into the new mentality. And so you're going to have to give those up. I'm afraid that that's what the price of peace is going to be going forward. Okay? You're going to hear a lot about the Equality Act. I'm going to tell you there's not much equality about it. You just read it, and, uh, but there's, there's trouble ahead if, er, if the people in power have their way because they want peace. We all want peace. I want peace, and we're supposed to pursue it. But it, it is not peace at any price. We cannot compromise truth for the sake of peace. That's why we need to learn to appeal to authority. Learn to not be argumentative, but present your arguments. Not be pejorative and, you know, have a chip on your shoulder, but rather articulate what does God say. And don't say it in a hateful way. Say it in a loving way. Again, back to... You know, you're not reviling, you're not using your tongue for evil, you're using it for good. So, uh, we seek peace and pursue it. So, how do we have a happy life? The first two ingredients for a happy life, in spite of opposition, are being a part of a compelling community and being a part of a blessing community, a community that blesses. And lastly, and we'll spend just a moment on this, and that is is that we are to be part of a trusting community. That's the last verse, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. A trusting community. This is, uh, we need to be a community that prays for and trusts God for his power. Because we serve a God whose ears are open to our prayers. And the reason they're open is not because we just do everything right. The reason they're open is because our Savior has died in our place. He has suffered the Father's wrath against our sin. And our sins have been forgiven through Christ. And we have been declared righteous. We have been declared not guilty, justified. And on that basis of being made right with God... We can talk with God. We can pray. We did it this morning in behalf of the Jennies. We'll do it again in, in uh, two months. We'll keep bringing before you people. We, we need to pray for not just our We need to pray for us and our impact on the community. We need to be a community that trusts God and prays for his power to be at work in hearts. That's what happened in the church in Jerusalem that we read about in the book of Acts. When they were threatened, they were opposed, they were told, listen, shut up, don't talk about Jesus anymore. You know, we, uh, you, this whole thing about his resurrection, it's a myth. You're lying. No, they weren't. He was alive. But they said, you're lying. Stop talking about it. And what did the church do? Did they, okay, put up your dukes? Or what did they do? They pulled back. They got together. They were a trusting community. You can read it in Acts 4 and verses 23 to 31. They got together and they cried, oh, God, here, here we are. We're before you and we worship you. Jesus is our Lord. He's given us this command, but he's, we're being opposed. We pray. And notice they didn't pray for relief. They prayed for power. They said, Lord, stretch out your hand and do wonders and give us grace to keep on preaching the gospel, the only message that saves. And we read later in chapter 5, it says, More than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, because they kept on praying and they kept on speaking. They were a trusting community. And as a result, their lives, though opposed, were filled with zest because they, they saw themselves as servants of God in a hostile world presenting God's merciful message of hope. And so they kept on speaking. God kept on answering. And more and more people were blessed. <clears throat> a common ingredient 
in all these ingredients is the word community, right? A compelling community, a blessing community, a trusting community. We need to be together as a community. I'm so glad that many of you are here today. And I know that for many, it's just not, uh, you don't feel safe yet for whatever reason, number of reasons to be here. So don't hear me saying, oh, what's wrong with you? I just long for the day when we can be in full force, that the pandemic can be behind us, that we can be this community for our community, that we can be a people that can bless. Even if, there, even if opposition comes, let us be a community that compels a trust in Christ. Let us be a community that blesses. Let us be a community that keeps looking to God for his power. And so, oh Lord, we pray as we gather here this morning, and not only that, but gathered uh, remotely. We're thankful for the technology, Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray for that day when we can be uh, together without fear of spreading anything except joy and encouragement. So, Lord, help us to be this community. We pray for an end to this pandemic. We pray for your power, Lord, to be displayed. And give us wisdom as we, as we labor and kind of slog through the limitations. Give us wisdom to be creative in ways to use the remote uh, technology to impact more people. But we know, Lord, that there's no substitute for being together. Lord, we pray for that day to be soon. And so we ask in Jesus' name.